There is a hashtag, hunting party. It does not trend. No influencers make witty 140 character quips about it. No armchair journalists offer hot takes. No politicians try to ride it for relevance. You have to search for it. In the city, people are searching. They search in the lounging, lazy suburbs. They search in the estates of Romanesque tenements. They search in schools and startups and stations and shopping centers. A lot of people are searching. In a room decorated with band posters and star maps, Mustafa taps into his phone. His father forbade him from joining the hunting party. His mother, remembering the rush of her own first kill at a similar age, the crack of bone under her fingertips, the blood smeared across her forehead. She whispered to him how to find it. She will not join this year, instead distracting Mustafa's father so he doesn't realize his son is gone. Because the hunt is coming. The wild hunt is coming. The Crown and Anchor is sat next to the old Roman road. There has always been a pub here, though it has not always been the Crown and Anchor. The Crown and Anchor is new. The place is old. 3,000 years of footsteps have walked this line. Inside, old man Jasper is perched on a barstool like a walrus on a rock. A forest of pint glasses are gathered in front of him, froths of spray scattered on their rims. Trick of the hunt, he says, is you've got to wait. Every year I tell people, hold, hold. They go to take their shot and wait, I tell them. Do they listen, Jasper? They don't, Precious. Every time, every time they go too soon and after they say, Jasper, I should have listened to you. Precious smiles to himself. Jasper is the only one in the bar and his rants are comforting, like white noise on a channel that stopped broadcasting. He will nod and smile because that's a bartender's job. Precious has never been on a hunt and never plans to. He finds the idea barbaric, though he would never say as much. Everywhere has its traditions, he thinks. He will serve Hunter's pints to the men and women who gather here early. A pint of Hunter's best with a few drops of blood mixed in and a green chartreuse chaser. It's chicken blood, but no one asks. They will drink and they will laugh and they will tell stories of Hunt's past. But they won't sing. Not yet. The hunt is dangerous. Some of them will not survive the night. Precious will serve them and wait until they return in the early hours. It will be past time on his license, but no one will question it on a hunt night. He will drink black coffee to keep himself awake until the hunters stagger back in, subdued or jubilant, either way, tired and bloody. Then he will serve them again, normal beer this time, and maybe now they will be singing. The hunting party goes on. The hashtag, of course, isn't really hunting party. If it was that easy, everyone would find it. You need to search. Or better, you need to be told. I'm not telling you what it is. When you find it, watch the tweets flash past like arrows. The anonymous online handles, the bravado, the speculation. You don't know who these people are. The accounts are all burners. They say you need a burner account before it can even be found. Eh, uh, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Well, consider it a head start. In days gone past, the wild hunt would ride into our world through a gateway in a stone circle, or a wind-blasted crossroads, or over a stile that marked a boundary between two fields that no longer exist. All places of transition, where one world became another. They found a boundary, and they pushed through, to spend the night killing everything they could find before riding back to fairy. You could be forgiven for thinking the wild hunter consigned to history. After all, we paved over the fields, tore down the stone circles, and staked traffic lights into the crossroads. But the city... The city is nothing but places of transition. 
We built a maze of intersections and drew a thousand boundaries. The wild hunt have always been drawn to liminal space. The city is nothing but liminal space. And the hunt have sniffed it out. They never learn. We do. That's why we use Twitter now. Mustafa is ahead of you. He knows the hashtag. Even now, he's reading the tweets anxiously under the desk in maths class. But most he just scrolls past. He's looking for one in particular. The one everyone's looking for. The one where Modem Prometheus tells everyone, here. The hunt will ride through, here. No one knows how they know. But they always do. There's a change in the classroom air. Mr. Graham, the teacher, has asked him something. Mustafa doesn't know what it was. He looks around to see people staring at him. Stephen Crocker, lounging at the back. Annie Malvery, prim as a china doll. The indistinguishable Elmsmere twins, Harry and Mary. For a flash of a second, he wonders if any of them are also coming to the hunt. If they're also feeling like the world's about to snap. But Mr. Graham is still waiting, so he looks at the equation on the board and says, X squared plus 2Y plus C? The class snickers. Mr. Graham sighs. I asked if you were paying attention. I guess I have my answer. Mustafa glances across at Annie Malvery, who rolls her eyes and looks away. And before long, Mustafa is scrolling again. He finds nothing from Modem Prometheus, but a tweet does catch his eye. The handle is at BN756432, and the avatar is a picture of SpongeBob. It says, My first time. I don't know if I want to do this. Hashtag hunting party. Hashtag stuff I'd never say out loud. Mustafa doesn't know anyone with the initials BN. It doesn't matter. He's not the only one feeling like this. He's not alone. Andrew Graham has a free period now. He should be using it for marking books. And he will, he tells himself, soon. But first, he logs onto Twitter. He searches for Hunting Party. The teacher is late to their English lesson, and so Stephen is telling everyone about the last hunt he went on, and what he's going to do on this one. He asks, you going? You going? Round the room. People mumble. No one confirms either way. I'm going, Mustafa says. He regrets it immediately. All eyes are on him. Stephen snorts. Like they'd ever let you on a hunt. Nah, man, staff is on my team when we're hunting. That's Rich Dalton. Mustafa dislikes him even more than Stephen. Crocker is a bully, but Dalton is vicious, with a tongue like broken glass. He'll never lay a hand on you, but leave you bleeding out all the same. And Mustafa, he knows what's coming. He's been here before. What? Stephen hasn't joined the dots. Looks at Rich like he's mad. Yeah, man, strap a bomb under his jacket, he'll run straight into the middle of him and boom! In the blood. In it, Staffy. Mustafa turns away, pretends to focus on his course book. Stephen hisses from behind him. We're gonna hunt you, Staffy. You're gonna see the wild hunt real close. And at that point, Mustafa realises... Stephen has never been on a hunt, and he's not going to this one. That should make him feel better, but it doesn't. It makes him feel like a bum. He's on his way to the lunch hall when Annie Malvery corners him. You said you were going. Are you going? Mustafa fumbles for words. He doesn't have a crush on Annie, has never thought about her that way, but she is pretty and her gaze is intense and this is confusing. I... I don't know. I... She's 
she looks disapproving, and who wouldn't be? To join the hunt is to celebrate death. Annie shakes her head and walks away. He wonders if she lost someone to a hunt past. Many people have, one way or the other. If you've seen The Hunt, you don't talk about The Hunt. Maybe you've heard the stories of the wild hunt tearing through the countryside, riding strange beasts that only seem half real, wielding blades that cut through trees and people just as fine. Maybe you've heard of people dragged into the storm to ride with The Hunt forever. Or at least, until they get bored of you. When The Hunt charged through the parish, the only option was to run or to hide. These stories aren't wrong, but they are old. Time's a fog. You can't see clearly through it. It's hard to imagine that charging mass of claws and fire on the streets of the city. But the Wild Hunt are always the Wild Hunt. They rode the land when it was fields and rivers, and they ride it now its factories and roads. The Wild Hunt don't change. We change. Modem Prometheus, in her seventh floor apartment. She knows this more than most. Once upon a time when they felt the changing of the air, those in her vocation would have cast bones or asked the wind where the hunt would come. Now she pulls in data on traffic movements and weather patterns from public APIs, converts it to a string of random numbers and processes it with JavaScript to generate a probabilistic model of a four-dimensional set of coordinates. There is where they will appear, where a river used to rise. There is where they will charge, down what was once its course. She tweets. Mustafa waits in his bedroom. He's wearing dark jeans, sturdy boots and a woolen beanie hat. He eyes his alarm clock nervously. 10.42 p.m. Is he going to miss it? Part of him wants to miss it. He feels sick. But he can't back out now. It can't be his fault. His door creaks and he dives for the bed in case it's his father. But it's his mother. She looks behind quickly then shuts his door. She doesn't turn on the light. I told you to stay under the covers! she says. Mustafa mutters something not even he can hear. Here, she says, and hands him a knife in a leather scabbard with the attachment that can hook it to your belt. A frog, his brain supplies. He remembers laughing when she told him what it was called. It seems less funny now. She pulls out the knife and shows it to him. Twelve inches, a wicked point, an edge fresh from the electric sharpener in the kitchen. This was your great granddad's bayonet, she says. Your granddad used it on his first hunt, and I used it on mine. Mustafa can't speak in case he blurts out he doesn't want to go. So he nods instead. Oh baby, you're going to have so much fun. I'm going to go downstairs and see your father. Wait five minutes and then you can sneak out quietly. Mustafa does. He doesn't go to the Crown and Anchor. He may be going to the hunt, but he's still a minor. Instead, he catches the 415 bus to the junction of Dalberg Road. If the driver notices the bayonet, she doesn't say anything. It is 11.34pm, and Mustafa has found the hunting party. There's dozens of people here. He sees Mr Graham throwing stinger strips across the road with three other people he doesn't recognise. Everyone has a gun or a knife or both. People are taking positions in upstairs windows, sighting on the street. What Mustafa sees would have everyone here locked up. But no police will be coming tonight. Not in their uniforms, at least. 
the residents of the streets have opened their houses. Some are handing out mugs of tea. First time, Ray. Mustafa looks up to see a huge man, almost spherical with walrus whiskers. He carries a broken shotgun over one arm. Have a sniff of that. Mustafa takes the flask. It's cheap brandy, but all he can feel is burn. The walrus laughs and claps him on the shoulder. For the first time Mustafa can remember, he doesn't feel like an alien. First timers will be in the charge, the walrus says. They always ask me they do. Jasper, what should we do with the first timers? And I always say let them go in the charge. Best place to learn the hunt, that is. Mustafa nods, unsure if he's meant to reply. Get yourself round the corner and at the junction over there. We'll soften them up for you. Mustafa goes where directed and sees a crowd of maybe 20 people. Some as young as him, some older. All looking nervous. All carrying knives. Annie Malvery is there. She gives him a razor-edged smile. And for a second, just a second, he thinks there's blood on her teeth. Mr. Graham walks over. He doesn't acknowledge Mustafa or Annie, but addresses the crowd. The hunt will be here in three minutes and 42 seconds. They move when he tells them not a second before. They wait. The street lamps flicker and die. They wait. The residents go back inside, lock and bolt their doors. They wait. A fox yelps and is abruptly cut off. And the wild hunt charge down the street and they are beautiful. Their steeds look like no animal from the mortal world. Huge horned cats, feathered serpents, unicorns with reptilian tails. Their riders are slight and a feet covered in brocaded armour that glows like an aurora and throws firework shadows onto the surrounding buildings. They have bows on their backs and carry blades that glow purple and steam as they cut the air. Beside Mustafa, Annie is buzzing like an overloaded capacitor. They've been told to stay quiet, but she can't stop moving. He lays a hand on her arm and her gaze lashes him like a whip, but her mouth tightens. She nods and tries to hold herself still. Wait. Jasper mutters from his window, though no one can hear. It's his own finger he talks to, twitching on the trigger. Wait. Wait. The hunt rolls like a tide down the street, animals and riders seeming to shift and blur with each other. They move in leaps and curves, graceful as an equation. The first beast to hit a stinger wails with static and collapses, throwing the rider, whose body cracks on the asphalt. There is a shudder through the charge as the fae try to stall their mounts, but they're moving too fast and soon more animals are shrieking and more riders fall. And as they cluster, the air explodes with shrapnel. The hunters pour their fire into the crowd, working in pairs. One releases every shell or bullet they have, cracks the gun and steps back and their partner takes their position while they reload. Just out of sight, Andrew Graham looks at his watch, counting off 30 seconds after the final shot. Go, he says. Annie Malvery lets out a yodeling scream and charges into the road, her knife held at her side. Mustafa and the other first-timers follow, pounding after her like dogs. The hunt is disoriented, confused by the flashbangs and shotgun blasts. Up close, they are small, and their language is a strange mix of buzzes and scratches. Annie has already gutted one of the fallen fae, a spurt of green blood staining her chest and face. Some fey lord, starting to regain his senses, pulls his mount around and trots towards her, a strange, steaming purple blade raised to strike. Mustafa cannons into the beast's side. It's not enough to drop the rider, but they're pushed off balance and Annie sees them come. 
She leaps at the fey, and together she and Mustafa drag it to the ground, the armor clattering as it hits tarmac like a thousand broken mirrors. Someone stamped on the fey lord's arm, shattering the bones so the blade falls from unresponsive fingers. Mustafa has no idea if it was him or Annie. He looks at her. She licks the green blood from her lips, wipes some from her face and smears it across his forehead. Then she hauls the fey upright, rips off its helmet and pulls back on its silver hair, exposing its throat. Mustafa looks into its eyes. Scared. Insectile. Other. Alien. He raises his knife. Modem Prometheus is written by Neil Merton and performed by Kate Angier. Produced and with original music by me, Namtal. Find more of my music at namtal.com and check out my other show, Lost Terminal. Please rate and review this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this right now. See you for episode two at the next full moon on the 19th of November. <laughs>